Welcome to today's episode of The Growth Zone. I am Christian Bartsch. What is the core benefit of listening to this show? Business leaders in corporate and privately held companies gain insights into trends and strategies that provide them with a competitive advantage in the marketplace. Each episode focuses on an area such as marketing, sales, innovation or funding that is absolutely critical to the growth of companies, whether they are startups or corporate global players, where management needs to juggle the challenges of market entry or knowing how to navigate the uncertainties of disruptive developments. Mindfeeding is where clarity evolves and helps solving organizational challenges. For those who listen to the entire episode, I have a special surprise gift. I am working on some great guests that are industry leaders in management, innovation and marketing. Let's get started on today's episode. I have for this episode of the growth zone, Jeff Chastain, who is a creator, a problem solver, a professional EOS implementer, providing entrepreneurial business leaders with the keys to scale their business. So we are going to be talking today about the entrepreneurial operating systems and how it actually helps us in our business. So let's have a thought about that. Creators do not believe in impossible. They are problem solvers and will find a solution using their creativity and knowledge that spans various areas of expertise. The creator is focused on building solutions that last and doing things right the first time. When you think of that, it definitely is true. And Jeff, starting a business at an early age, whether it was massive Lego creations or custom software programs, he has not stopped since then. After more than 15 years working with business leaders, Many of the tools and systems have evolved. But he still enjoys seeing a process work efficiently, confidence return to a leadership team and an organization positioned to scale in a predictable manner. So that's quite an interesting perspective on Jeff and Let's go and have our conversation. Just to remind you, my name is Christian Bartsch, your host, and I'm going to be talking to Jeff from Texas. He's based near Dallas. So I've got now with me Jeff Chastain and... Yeah, we've got some really super interesting topics all around business, around creating an effective vision for your business. And yeah, so Jeff, before we get started going into the topics, the, the deep questions that we've got for you, please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Th I want to start off by just saying thanks for having me on. It's it's always been interesting. I've been listening to the podcast for a while and always love hearing your guests and your different topics there. Um, really, my story or my background actually started in tech these days. So I, I've been in tech for 15 plus years or whatever, and just kept working with business owners that were trying to put in solutions to problems that they weren't really addressing. And that's really where I got my introduction, my switch over to EOS and business coaching many years ago, just looking for a way to, okay, what is the, the entrepreneurial kind of solve the entrepreneurial kind of foundation that we could go back in and build into those businesses. And that's really what I, I enjoy working with those kind of entrepreneurs, talking with them just to learn more about their business and help them solidify that foundation. Great. So uh, where are you based? I'm actually out of Texas, out of Dallas area. So we're over in the States. Oh, cool. That's very nice. So, 
It must be nice, quite quite hot now in the summer. It is definitely that. Yeah, we're we're hundred plus degrees and enjoying the, the the heat of summer, July and August is always the fun part down here. Yeah, that's with us as well here. We've got quite a quite a good temperature now, but that's why we've got usually in the morning already all the blinds down, uh, and then that keeps um, the old buildings quite warm with half a meter or so thick walls keeps you nice and cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but nevertheless, that's a great thing to to use this time to get new insights, new ideas, and that. And therefore, I think um, let's go into the maybe the first question that I've got for you. And that is, what is a business operating system and what does it solve for an entrepreneurial business owner? Oh, sure. So the operating system, like I said, my background was was originally previous life in tech. So whenever I hear the term operating system, I always go to like Windows versus Mac kind of a thing. But from a business standpoint, the operating system, um, if you go dig up terminology or dig up definitions out there, it's really what makes your business. So it's goes anywhere or covers everything from, okay, how do you handle your people from hiring, firing, reviews, et cetera? How do you go out into the market and solicit new uh, leads, new customers, et cetera? How do you go about delivering your service, your product, just everything top to bottom that makes up your XYZ company way is really what the operating system term covers. So the reality is every business has an operating system. A lot of it may be the fly by the seat of your pants, figure it out as you go kind of operating system versus being a, a more standardized approach. But the the operating system term just describes how you go about doing your business. So when we come at it from a an EOS perspective, it's obviously entrepreneurial operating system is EOS. And the the intent here was to look at small businesses, entrepreneurial business owners, and design a really a simple set of tools, a simple set of processes that can take your business from the, the early startup days where everything's just dependent upon making a sale, getting, getting customers, getting revenue in the door and saying, okay, now it's time to grow up. Now it's time to mature a little bit into a really a real business at this part point to start scaling and to start building some of that foundation underneath you. And that's really where EOS comes into play, that it's it's that simple set of tools, that simple set of ideas, practices, nothing really rocket science. It's been around forever, but it's it's just those ideas that really resonate with a an entrepreneurial type owner to help really solidify the, the foundation of their business and help it grow with a structured approach rather than, like I said, flying by the seat of your pants kind of a thing at all times. Yeah, exactly. So having some strategies as well, the long-term strategies, thinking what do you want to achieve? Um, what are you going to use? How And what, for instance, are the things you're not going to tolerate as well in the business? It means as well, for instance, who are you willing to do business with or not? I had a similar experience today um, where somebody called, made a di uh, cold call and uh, tried to bypass the person on the phone before me and was being very, very negative in their behavior. And then later on, I got told about that. And I said, uh, if this person calls again, let, uh, give him to me and I'll tell him, I'll see how he behaves. And then I'll tell him that uh, that's not the way to get the business because he definitely isn't going to, going to do business with us because that doesn't work. And, and as you say, I can, of course, go and say, well, I do with this and with that not. Or am I not going to tolerate these things? Or for instance, how do I treat pe people? How do I treat people where I'm going to have to uh, put them on the road because maybe I don't need them anymore or they haven't performed as well? Or how can I maybe motivate somebody? I need to have some standard. I will ask one employee says, hey, you treat that one better than me, so we're not equal. Hmm. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of what this comes into is like, okay, like you're saying, how do you treat people? How do you, how do you identify who the right people are in the first place to be able to hire them? How do you manage them going forward and make sure everybody's on the same page with expectations, things like that? So yeah, you're, you're, the idea of how you do your business, how you're going to, what your identity is right there, what your vision is from your business, that, that really resonates throughout the business, both like you're saying, internal employees, as well as external customers and uh, the type of people we're going to work with. Exactly. And that's the thing, because you want to, in the end, long term, you want to, you are building a business um, that's going to exist for a long time. And it doesn't matter whether you're going to be there as a long time 
person in it or whether you are eventually exited in, in 10 or 20 years whenever you decide to retire or you do start something new because you need some change of of environment or for whatever reason but it, it still means you're building it from the perspective that it has to be uh, sustainable and as well um, in a way that it's not going to collapse the next day because somebody does something stupid yeah mm -hmm. yeah so um, as you said especially when it comes to to standardize versus as you go um, what can people actually do in that area well from a a standardization it really comes down to defining what the processes are because really like i said earlier when i was dealing with technology and a lot of the reasons i kind of moved away from that is people would look at technology and say okay we need a new crm system sales are down so let's put in our new crm system here and then get everybody organized and the problem that they were trying to address with a technology tool and i don't mean to despise technology it's definitely very useful got its place and everything but if you don't have For example, a defined sales process that, okay, this is who we're reaching out to in terms of our market. This is the terminology. This is our, our differentiators that we're going to use when we're reaching out to those prospects. This is what the, the sales pipeline looks like in terms of steps A, B, and C. Then just putting a, a tool, a, a CRM or something on that really doesn't solve anything at that point. You're, you're, trying, to, you're, you're trying to fix it way too high level. So... That's actually what got my introduction. I was dealing with a startup company at that point, getting extremely frustrated that the owner didn't wasn't able to put those processes, wasn't able to define what the company way was and blaming technology for it when it's like, okay, if we don't have the foundation, it doesn't matter what technology we put out there, you're still going to run into issues. So I actually got introduced to uh, EOS and Attraction at that point, and it was just like light coming on kind of a thing there that... The way traction and the way EOS approaches it is it's really, there's there's six key components, but one of those components is really a process component to say, okay, we need to build, go in and define what is your way of doing things. And there's not necessarily a, a right way or a wrong way. Every, every company's got their own way, but the idea is that we systematize that, we put processes around that way so that obviously from a, a scaling perspective, you as the owner At first, you're wearing all the hats kind of a thing, but you're going to basically hit that point where, okay, you're holding your own company back by trying to do everything, and you've got to start delegating out responsibilities here. But at the same time, just because you go hire John Doe over here that knows he's an expert in sales, supposedly, and bring him into your company and say, okay, go sell, if he doesn't understand your company, understand your vision, understand the market, understand everything about this because it's all honestly in your head, then it doesn't matter how good of a salesperson he is, he's still going to fail at that point, or at the very least, not meet your expectations. So that's where the process kind of part falls into play that, okay, we've got to have defined processes to say, okay, this is our way of selling. This is our way of delivering this product from an operational standpoint or supporting the customer. Things like those processes have to be defined out in order, if nothing else, like you said, get that information, get that expertise out of the owner's head so that that business can scale, can grow, and hopefully really grow beyond them to where they don't have to do everything in the business every day. Yes, that's true. Uh, I see it from my own business. Uh, one of my businesses started over 10 years ago. We as well, um, when I had my first business coaching as well, we started as well uh, looking at all different processes And I used a tool that's, um, I think it's called iGraphics Process. And that was really very good because you could really break down every kind of area in the business and you knew what happened, where did it go and when this was this, what happens then, or this or this or this route would go. And so you could really uh, understand it. And later on, we had our own management tool inside which we have still using now and uh, of course depending on the status of the ticket that we have it goes a different route because you can't implement software if you or workflows if you don't know what, which would be the right route otherwise it just gets lost somewhere and you yeah, go in yeah. circles and the other person who's sitting uh, on the desk and, and trying to do something um, he isn't automatically looking every time oh what's the next right step He gets his suggestions from there and he can see, okay, 
is this this no that's not fitting oh i need to wait for payment or for instance uh, i have to send our documents to to the to the customs agent or something for instance simple things like that that already remind me oh otherwise i'll forget that i have to get that done before i can't ship the stuff out beforehand otherwise we get problems and the customers unhappy and so on and so on and that brings me actually as you say standardizing is so important and and getting this stuff out of the entrepreneur's mind out and putting onto paper um, what do you think as well diagrams and all stuff is is helpful as well not just filling pages of text Oh yeah, no. With with that, that's one area we really focus on when we're doing processes is taking more of what we refer to as a twenty eighty approach. That the idea is not to go out and build the SOP manual that's six inches thick, sits on the shelf, collects dust because nobody wants to read it. That we've got to keep in mind the the entrepreneurial fashion of being agile, being quick to move, quick to address things here, and build this process. Basically, to go in and look at all of your your business and say, okay, what's the top twenty percent of the core key processes that we need to do in order to do our operation on a daily basis. And then with those, we go in and document just the just the bare minimum on that to say, okay, what is that quick diagram, quick workflow, whatever here, what are the key steps, what's the key measurables, the key flags, whatever that goes into this process so that I could hand this to somebody and they would know what to do here without my sitting here giving them every single little step, hand holding them kind of a thing there that we're, we're obviously trying to empower our team. So we don't want to turn them into robots and say, okay, here's, here's exactly how you handle your day. We want to give them the high level pieces that we can one document pretty quickly and adapt as we go along, but two, just give them enough information, enough knowledge to sit there and run with and do it in a consistent manner, but still leverage their expertise and their their abilities there with those processes. So it's a, a much more streamlined, a much more simplistic approach that that's, that's if you look at EOS as an overall whole, simplicity and clarity is two of the biggest concepts that we're trying to do. So we don't want to implement uh, those big heavy processes, the big heavy SOPs that nobody's going to follow because that's that's what happens all the time. You want to keep it keep it light, keep it simple at that point, and say, okay, here's just the key points you need to know in order to go do this. Yeah, so that saves us for a lot of time and effort, especially when you're onboarding new employees because you've oh, yeah. got everything simple to understand. And that one knows, okay, I know what to do because usually, I know usually when you hire somebody, it takes usually six months until they've actually uh, found their place in the organization. And the bigger the organization, the more more exhausting it is. Uh, I know the first first job that I started uh, in a corporate, uh, the first six months I was, was in the evening, I was dead tired. I was exhausted after the whole stuff, doing some different partners, finding this out, getting this and this and so on. Seven in the evening, I fell asleep on the sofa and woke up two in the morning. I thought, what? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, crazy, crazy, and that's the the thing. The thing you see as well in others when you talk with others, they say, "Yeah, same experience." Ah, the bigger the corporation or the company, the more complex it is because, of course, then you have to see, "Oh, I don't tread on the wrong pe- person's attitude." So you find, okay, this person has this and this behavior. You have to handle them somehow that they don't explode like a volcano. And the other one, you have to be nice and friendly, and then you you cuddle them so to speaking and then eventually they give you the the help and support you need um and the other one you have to be nice and and, and uh as you'd say uh putting honey on them and then they'll be happy as well to agree and who to avoid <laughs> because yeah. you can't get on with them but that's the thing that eats up and on the other hand if you go and say hey let's focus on what exactly you have to do how to do it it's easier so that relieves already one big chunk of of energy that usually is drawn out of the person and then because maybe that's as well clearer everybody isn't behaving like a bunch of monkeys and it's much much easier to handle Uh, even if the boss goes for half a year out of the office and then comes back and he just he doesn't want to find a lot of crazy monkeys jumping around and and shouting at each other uh, arguing and so he wants to find that everybody is doing a good job and yeah there may be some things that have to clear but uh it's it's doable so uh talking of that um so i've got another another really nice question that i'd like to go a bit deeper as well with you and and that's what are some things that business owners can do 
to break through the ceiling that is holding their business back? Sure. Yeah, we've actually kind of touched on it already a little bit, but it's the the idea of hitting the ceiling is really something that you don't hear a lot necessarily in business, but it's something that honestly every single business runs into because business doesn't grow as just a, a smooth straight line path here that there was actually a study done. I think it was actually back in the sixties that refers to the terms evolution and revolution in business or evolution stage. And the evolutionary stages are simply that, that, that nice calm period, continuous growth, uh, no major setbacks or internal disruptions, but that only continues for a, a short period of time kind of thing before we hit a ceiling and basically end up in that, that revolution stage. So that can be anything from an external crisis, a change in the market. Obviously, today with this recording, a, a, a pandemic kind of thing worldwide, it could be as simple as just a, a key employee leaving or, or being out of the office for some time, but basically some kind of crisis happening in the business and it's really a time where the the way things have been being done, the practices, the strategies, et cetera, that were appropriate before really aren't appropriate anymore. They they're they're just not working. And it's basically it's sitting there frustrating all the the team is like, OK, what we did before worked. Why isn't it working now? What do we need to do now in order to move on? And that's where we see a lot of especially in the entrepreneurial, the smaller businesses, that's where we see a lot of failures because you hit that ceiling and basically you're left with. Uh, three different options there that, okay, hopefully you can break through and keep growing. That's that's obviously the positive side to it. The the other alternative is that, okay, we can basically hit that ceiling and just flatline at that point. All of a sudden growth stagnates that, okay, this is just, we almost kind of accept it and say, okay, this is just the way business is. We can't grow any bigger. We can't break into that new market, whatever the issue is. And then the other option is obviously that the business fails at that point. And that's what we see especially by the time they hit that five-year point, is that, okay, we're seeing a lot of drop-off, a lot of failures in that business because they simply can't adapt and can't break through that ceiling. So um, really, I guess another way to kind of look at this is if you think about how a, a child or how the human body grows, that there's not a continuous growth, uh, smooth line path, that they have growth spurts at that point that... You wake up one day and wait a minute, junior here is now three inches taller and the pants don't fit kind of a thing. But the the idea there is that obviously with those growth spurts, they have growing pains at that point. And the human body is really a pretty amazing system that it has the ability to adapt and change and move through those growing pains. But from a business standpoint, as business leaders, we've got to be able to do the same kind of thing within the business have that same kind of adaptive kind of abilities there to help facilitate that growth in the business and keep the business growing at that point. So that's kind of one of the first things we really look at from an EOS perspective is that concept of hitting the ceiling, because a lot of the tools, a lot of the practices, everything we build into EOS is really designed to help the organization identify that, hey, we, we are running into problems here and have the tools in place, like we talked about earlier, the simplification uh, the systems, things like that, in order to be able to break through that system and keep moving at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Because as you say, when it grows, it can even be that your infrastructure just can't cope with it. Or now, like with this pandemic and so on, everybody is working from home in many businesses. Then you have to somehow realign your entire IT. You have to have everything offline. For instance, with us, we've got a phone system that's standing in the internet and everybody is scattered across Europe. And it doesn't matter. We don't have to fly in and, and meet. So everybody is working from home. And most of our clients are doing the same thing. So we're capable to do that. And for instance, I was just today just planning a, a meeting and we do it over, over a phone system. So it's super easy because everybody has their app on it. But if you haven't got that and you reach that capacity, you're getting new clients and suddenly this pandemic hits you, they think, oh, what do I do? I'm now offline because nobody's in the office or one person that can't handle it. It's just not made for it. Yeah. yeah, definitely so. And it, it really kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. And that's the exact example right there of, of having those kind of systems in place, whether it's actual technology systems or just business systems to say, OK, even if things do change now, OK, we've got everybody in remote offices. There's still a, a process, a system in place that this is the way we do business. So whether it's your uh, at home and now having to do Zoom meetings instead of face-to-face -face coffees or face-to-face -face sales calls, 
there's we still have a sales process. We may have to go in and adapt that sales process to say, okay, new tools, new technology here, but we've still got the XYZ Solutions company way of doing sales or working through things. We just have had to adapt to an outside change now and still leverage that process, but just doing things, changing a few things at the high level in a different way. Absolutely. And when you look at it, for instance, at retail and so on, the big retailers and, and even small restaurants and, and other kind of shops and that, they all are now having to adapt to a situation that they are wanting to have digital payments. For instance, uh, a local baker as well here, usually you couldn't get your cake or, or you couldn't have a coffee or anything uh, if it wasn't and pay with a credit card and so on. It, usually it had to be a certain amount and that was, you'd have to like feed five people to reach that level. And now you can go and buy practically a bun for for a few bucks and you pay with a credit card and they, they're not complaining anymore. So it's, yeah. it's a quite a different change of mindset. And at the same time, it's, Something is happening in the back because suddenly, of course, accounting, they are the people who are usually often forgotten and, and the people who are responsible for sales and so on, they have to handle, oh, wait a minute, now we haven't got any so much cash. We don't need so much cash to be uh, moved back and forth to the bank and so on with uh, security services and so on. But we've got now lots of credit card payments or how do we match that? Because, of course, then fees are going to take off and these companies are maybe not used to handling it. And now they're overboarding. Oh, so maybe they have to think, hey, maybe we have to adapt the way we do accounting and maybe what system we're using because we can't use the systems now we have because we are not in the office. We've got our credit cards and we've got this and that. And oh, it's just too much crazy stuff happening so fast. They can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. And, and and really, this is actually a, a, a perfect example that nobody was looking at this and predicting this was going to happen kind of a thing that, that things just happen in business that we can't necessarily always predict or foresee. And it's just a matter of saying, OK, do we have the foundation in place that I, I always go back to the 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 old parable of saying, OK, house built on the sand versus house built on, on the rock. And if your house is basically built, if your business is built on that sand that, okay, we don't really have the systems, we're just trying to figure things out as we go, then you hit a major crisis, something like this, then obviously you don't have the foundation there. And that's where we see, because I, I look at a lot of the businesses today that are happening today, and there's obviously some parallel or some uh, specific industries that are being hit pretty hard that obviously restaurant, and hospitality and stuff like that. But even within those industries, it's the ones that have the foundation set that are able to adapt, that are coming out and thriving still versus the ones that just simply can't adapt. They, they, don't, they don't know how, they don't have, like I said, that foundation, those systems, those processes, those pieces in place, they're the ones that are really struggling. So it's not so much specific industries or specific types of businesses so much as, okay, what was your foundation before we ran into a crisis like this? And are you able to move forward? Because the reality is we're going to get beyond this, but there's still going to be a new crisis around the corner kind of a thing. Like I said, even it could be even as simple and local as just having a key employee leave or go on maternity leave or go whatever it is kind of a thing that all of a sudden they're no longer in the picture. Can somebody else step up and take over their role right there? Do you have that kind of processes, those kind of roles in place, that kind of information in place to say, OK, John's taking leave for the next month here can Mary step up and handle the the inventory processing here that John handle on a daily basis because we have all that information, those systems, those processes documented, or does all that information walk out the door with John in his head? So it's 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 those kind of businesses that can adapt and that have that information are typically the ones that survive these crises a lot better rather than being specific industry related here. Yeah, exactly. That's why as well I see that as well now as I think as changing, it's not just the infrastructure is changing as well, uh, the people, the way people are doing business or the way some people are not adapting as well to certain requirements. Because uh, when you think of it, everybody is now moving into the home office. And when you do international business and that business deals, sometimes you have to send in documents. So you can, of course, ship them with UPS and that or DHL Express and that quickly 
um, across long distances, but it's not as massive and fast as we were used to it, like two, three years ago. And on the other hand, uh, the complexity is, of course, that certain deals you have to fax the, the documents over and then have them uh, approved or, or confirmed by a lawyer or anything and then uh, send them across the pond with express service and so on to really uh, secure your deal. And that's become a problem because, of course, most people now don't have fax machines at home. And, of course, it has to be from a company line. So that's, of course, the next problem. And, that, and then IT starts thinking, oh, God, how do we adjust this? And it has to be user-friendly so that they can use it. Because if we set up something and they can't use it, we're having, like, all the time nightmares and people are just getting frustrated and they are leaving eventually because they say, oh, yeah. if I get stomach pain every day trying to do my work, eventually I, I find a solution. <laughs> I get yeah. the job and go somewhere else where I'm not going <laughs> to go <laughs> nuts. <laughs> because at a certain point, either the husband or the wife will say, you either get a new job or you get a new place to stay without me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's it's true. There's a, a certain level where everybody can assist, and sometimes you maybe need to have that extra kick to to decide. Okay, and say, hey, they're obviously not accepting to adapt and not flexible enough. So the risk, of course, of them not able to survive, maybe at a certain point, is even higher than. Oh, well, it's it's definitely that, and it's but a lot of times businesses, even like in that those smooth growth phases, will still run into that. That if we don't have to find out what a specific role is or a specific person's seat is to say, okay, this is where your level of responsibility is. You're in charge of A, B, and C measurables. You're in charge of these numbers right here, and that's it. Then that that just adds on to the stress of the employees to say, wait a minute, what am, what's my tasking today? Oh, it changed from yesterday's kind of a thing because manager A said this, and now manager B says this. I don't know who I report to. I don't know how this works. And we see that a lot of times, especially in the the small businesses, just because there's not a, a big corporation width of employees to kind of spread that over. Now, all of a sudden, we've only got 10, 15 employees here now that we're trying to get all this done. And if everybody doesn't have a, a defined role within that organization to say, hey, this is where I'm responsible. I don't have to worry about those other pieces here. That's really where a lot of that that stress and that angst and stuff like that builds in. You lose people, you lose your key employees because they just don't have any satisfaction in their job anymore that, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I'm supposed to be good at. And this is what I, I get credit for that. If I'm getting blamed for things that are, I didn't even know I was supposed to be working on or supposed to be doing, that doesn't lead to a lot of job satisfaction there. And that, that really gets amplified at that smaller entrepreneurial kind of level. I I've done both the entrepreneur side as well as the corporate side. And it's, it's definitely easier to get lost in the corporate side but at the same time, it still builds that frustration. It's like, okay, what am I doing? How am I contributing to the organization? That just gets amplified a lot more when you're only one of 15 employees instead of one of 500. Exactly. And when you think of it from perspective of the client as well, if uh, I'm dealing with somebody and he doesn't know whether he can approve it or he can get that whatever I want and he has to go back and forth all the time, then there's, of course, a weakness in the in the sales process as well and the sales organization because then uh, he is he has a certain uncertainty where he loses his confidence just once I hit the right chord and then he is uh, falling down the stairs, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, he should at least have enough power to pro do a proper deal without having to run back and forth to the manager because otherwise I say, well, then I don't need to speak to him because he hasn't anyway anything to say yeah. other than giving me the, the leaflets on sending me some information. Uh, that's no point. Otherwise, I as a class customer, I'm wasting my time and it doesn't matter whether I'm the CEO of the company is going to buy whatever they're offering or the purchasing manager or the IT director or whatever. <laughs> Nowadays, you haven't got that much time when you have to work from home and uh, you've got you've saved maybe time commuting, but you've got other problems that add then from the other side. <laughs> like you've got kids at home who are not going to school and so on. They need yep. as well time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. And it's it's when your when your team doesn't feel like they've been empowered like that, then that obviously leads to less satisfaction with it. Whereas if they've got a a process that says, "Hey, as long as we meet these boxes, you're 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 good to move on to the next step. You're good to close the agreement, whatever it is." Right there, that that just empowers your team, and really, it, it's it's the concept of delegation. You 
as the owner, as the entrepreneur, you still, you can't, you've got, and if, if you're going to scale, if you're going to successfully grow the business, you've got to be able to hand those things off to your team and say, okay, this is our way of doing things. And if you do them this way, then go for it. You're empowered. You, you don't have to come to me from, for my approval. If you're doing things the right way or doing things the company way, then this is yours, go kind of a thing. And that's that really, that's the key to being able to scale a business is that you've got to be able to take that hat off, have it well-defined enough that you can trust that your teammates doing it, but be able to give that hat to them and say, okay, this is now sales is now your responsibility. As long as you're showing me the metrics, showing me the measurables that says everything's a green light in sales, I'm going to stay out of your pocket. I'm, I'm not going to get in there because I'm empowering you to go run with this because we've got the processes, we've got the systems, we've got the metrics in place that I trust, one, you're the right hire to be in that seat, and two, that you're capable of doing this and you're going to go follow our process. And that's really the point that, uh, honestly, and, and I, I struggle with this myself, it's kind of like delegation's hard because you're used to be able to do it on your own and you're used to be able to saying, hey, this is the way I want things done. And if you don't have that documented out from a process standpoint, you never really feel comfortable that the the salesperson you hired in is really doing things right because you don't have the visibility. So therefore it's nat natural, natural, if I can say it right, to, to be riding in their back pocket, say, okay, wh wh what are we going to do now? Are we really going to make this decision? And you just don't give them the confidence. You don't give them the empowerment there to go forward that they feel like they're always looking over their shoulder. Okay. Is the, is this the way the boss wants it? Is this the way the boss wants to do things? It, it just hampers and, and basically that's one of those ceilings right there that you're going to hit with a an entrepreneurial business like okay you've got to be able to hand those things off and trust your people there yeah and when and as you say when the business is going of course you're going to hire as well more people and let's say even if it's an it company that develops some kind of product or an engineering company you may be hiring more engineers, more programmers, and other ones that are already there, maybe they've already got so much knowledge about the product or what they're doing and the processes that they get promoted. And then they, have, of course, have to start learning how do I delegate to my new staff to get them onboarded quickly. They do this stuff properly the way we do it and not maybe the way it's done in university or done in the ABZ company or whatever, but it's the way it's done here. And... This person, of course, learns as well with this new role how to report to the person above him properly in a way without uh, causing new problems because he says, I don't speak to my ex-colleague because he's now the department in Group B and I'm Group A. I don't speak to him when I've got a problem in Group C because the software doesn't work with that. They have to still get together and discuss the things before they eventually release a product that doesn't work at all <laughs> because it's then yeah. otherwise garbage and the company goes out of business. It really is. And you, you made the mention early on about uh, a six month ramp up time or whatever with a big company. It's like entrepreneurial organizations can't afford that. It's like you, you got you need to start reporting or start delivering next week kind of a thing here. So the the simpler you can make that transition to say, OK, what one of the big tools we look at is, is an accountability chart. And basically it's a I refer to it as the the old org chart on steroids kind of a thing, because we, we first look at it from the structure of the organization to say, OK, we have a seat over here. We have a box over here on the accountability chart that is in charge of new customer sales here. And there are defined roles for that seat to say, OK, this seat is in charge of X, Y and Z. Here's the processes that are attached to that so that whichever person we happen to put into that seat they know right off the bat, okay, here is exactly what I'm in charge of. Here's exactly what's expected of me. Here's the, the processes, the way I go about doing this. And they can jump into that, step into that real easy and move forward, be accountable, be actionable on that. Whereas if you just say, hey, John, come over here and handle sales tomorrow. What, what's the likelihood he's going to succeed or at least be productive in any time soon kind of thing if you don't have that structure in place? And when you're doing it from an entrepreneurial level, you've just got to have that that kind of structure in place simply because you don't have six months to sit there and have somebody learn on the job. Exactly. And how, how do you uh, help these companies that they actually then uh, get this accountability charge into everybody's head? I don't know. Do you put a big poster on the, on the next wall or does everyone get the sheet or so that he knows what I'm responsible for? If I need this and this, do I ask Tom, do I ask Peter, or who do I go? How do you uh, help them to get that more or less into a manageable day-to-day -day solution? 
Sure. Yeah. No, that's that's one of the keys really with EOS is uh, open and honest and transparency with the organization that I will in my in my coaching, I actually will work with the leadership team at the top to say, OK, let's define out from the the accountability chart. What is the the right structure for your company? Is it boxes, separate boxes for sales and marketing or do they they stick together? What's what's the operational seats, all that kind of stuff. We lay out that chart and define with them to say, OK, what's the structure for your organization? And then at that point, we'll go put the people into that. But it's, it's two separate pieces. But the idea is that, OK, from a transparency standpoint, we'll get to a certain point in this coaching process. And then it's on a really what we define as a 90 day world. We'll actually have the leadership team say, OK, it's time for a company meeting every 90 days to update your the entire organization on where things are, what our goals are, what our vision is, and share all of this information down all levels to where everybody in the company understands exactly, okay, here's the accountability chart. Here's where I sit in this chart. Here's what I'm responsible for in my position. I can obviously see the people around me, see where where I fit into the puzzle, because that's one of the biggest keys is to be able to just understand in the organization, what am I accountable for? How am I contributing? Because if I can see how I'm contributing to the overall vision, that'll lead to much better job satisfaction and then belonging to that company kind of a thing rather than just being a job. It's like, I want to feel like I'm part of the company, part of this organization and helping them move forward. Not that I'm just some replaceable intern kind of something here on this, this big org chart. So it's, it's really pushing that information down throughout the company. Cause it's, again, it's one thing for the, the entrepreneur, the owner, even the leadership team to have it in their head. But if that doesn't get disseminated down to the rest of the company, it's still almost a, a, they just don't know where we're headed. It's like they're riding on the ship, they're riding, riding down the path here, but they can't. They have no visibility. It's like, okay, what are we doing as a company? Or like you said, who am I supposed to talk to? Who am I supposed to report to? What am I really supposed to do here? That I, I know my tasking for today, but how does that really fit into the bigger picture? And that's where you lead to a lot of a lot of turnover, a lot of job loss, kind of a thing there. When it's just a job to me, and it's like, okay, if it's just a job, and company down the street here is willing to pay me more to, to go work a job down there. What, what connection do I have to your organization here if, if all it is is just a job? Exactly, because then otherwise you have as well no real opportunity to grow yourself as well in your job and, and rise, get new talents, more abilities, skills, and so on. There's no point in being there. Exactly, yeah. And it's it's your, your goal really from a, a business owner standpoint should be honestly to train and empower your, your employees that granted, if they take those skills and take them to somewhere else, that that's still fine. It's, it's, if you can't, if you try to hold them back or whatever, then all you're doing is limiting yourself at that point. So we really want to do whatever we can to empower your team, make sure that they really feel like they're a part of your organization, that they have a place, that they have a reason for being there, that they have the ability to contribute and really just help them grow, help them grow both in that role as well as to see, hey, if I, if I learn these other new skills, maybe I can move into this seat or take on these other responsibilities kind of a thing to have them with that clarity, that, that ability to sit there and say, OK, I see what's going on around me. Let, let's see what I can do to, to grow and to adapt and to help out, really. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, Jeff, it was great having you here on the show. Um, how can people get in contact with you if they want to reach out? Well, the biggest way is just through through my website. So it's Admentus, A-D-M-E-N-T-U-S dot com. And just like I said, there's there's a, lot, there's a resources page over there that's got uh, actually free chapters around a couple of the books there. If you're interested in traction or get a grip kind of thing, there's things there. Or just simply mm-hmm. reach out to me and ask questions. So it's it's just ask ask at admentus.com and just reach out. Any questions you got, I'm always happy to help or happy to provide any guidance I can. Great. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you for being. And yeah, looking forward to our future conversations when we'll be talking about other interesting topics. Really appreciate it.
I hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Growth Zone with Christian Barge. Thank you for listening. Please leave a review or rating here on iTunes or on podchaser.com. If you found the content helpful, then share it on social media. I would like to invite you to follow our show so that you don't miss the upcoming interviews with leaders in the market. Simply visit the website follow.prmediareach.com. I will be adding the link also to the description of this episode so that you just need to click on that link. For those of you who are listening, and signing up to follow the show, I have reserved a free copy of the Ultimate Guide on Content Marketing. This is the strategy that got me top corporate clients like McDonald's, Linde, Hewlett Packard, Deutsche Bank, Volvo and many others. That strategy has been working for over 10 years. It also got me contacts with police, transport authorities, military and several universities and even leading research institutes. For sure, it also worked wonders as it got me many small, medium and sized entrepreneurs and enterprises as clients. And that even included international clients from all around the world. The link to sign up for our free broadcasting service and the guide is follow.pr mediareach.com That will give you access to the most recent version of my ultimate guide on content marketing. You can follow me as well on Twitter by using the Twitter handle CAP Barge. That's spelled Charlie Alpha Papa Bravo Alpha Romeo Tango Sierra Charlie Hotel. Yes, that is C-A-P, Barge. Charlie, Alpha, Papa, Bravo, Alpha, Romeo, Tango, Sierra, Charlie, Hotel.